may be rational creatures in the universe that disagree with me and are making no mistake. A, you know, a, an intelligent Martian sandworm that lives in a completely different kind of society may not give, yeah, might not give a stuff about the sort of things that I want in a friend or a citizen. It also might not care about claw hammers or carving knives, right? It's possible for there to be rational beings in the universe and even rational beings in this room that want different things or say, what is it to me? You may not care about hanging up pictures on walls or doing carpentry or you might not live in a cave and whatever. You might not care about the things that make a claw hammer a good claw hammer. You may say, what is it to me? But that, and you may be doing nothing irrational when you say that. But at the same time, when I want certain things from the claw hammer, I've been perfectly rational and non-arbitrary, and I don't need to have God on my side or to say that the universe itself somehow endorses my values. And that's really what we mean. That's all we really mean when we say that values are not objective. When we say that values are not objective, all we mean is that when we make the value judgments, ultimately we have to make them against the needs or the wants or the interests or the purposes of subjects, of things with subjectivity, like you guys and like me. And when we make those judgments, even though you know, God isn't there to agree with the judgments and the yeah, non-living, non-sentient universe doesn't somehow agree with them, they can still be perfectly rational, non-arbitrary judgments. If I say I prefer my friends to be loyal, that's not an arbitrary claim. And you know, I have very good reasons to want my friends to be loyal because of what it is that we want from friends. Now, what it is that we want from friends depends upon our nature, and therefore it depends on the nature of things with our subjects, things with subjectivity. It's not somehow endorsed by something out there or up there, metaphysical. But it's a perfectly rational, non arbitrary judgment that I can defend in a perfectly rational and reasonable way. It gets harder and harder, of course, the more abstract it becomes. It's very easy with the claw hammer or the carving knife to say what features or properties we are thinking of when we say this is a good hammer or a good carving knife. But what if we say this is a good human being? Or this act was a good act? Now, by this point, the kinds of needs, values, purposes, and so on that lie behind that value judgment are becoming very vague and very open to being contested. And so you can expect a lot of disagreement that is perfectly rational. And it means that by this point, if someone just says in a very simple way, that's a good human being, well, you know, in context you might not be getting it. You might, they might mean that's a person acted kindly. Or something. Yeah, it might make some sense in context. But if someone just says that that's a good human being, you may not know what they mean. It may be very different than saying that's a good claw hammer or that's a good knife. Very vague what properties or features they're really pointing to. And there can be a great deal of disagreement because there's a, there is a great deal of rational disagreement as to what it is that we want from our fellow human beings. So when I say someone's a good human being, meaning, you know, meaning a morally good human being, I suppose. You know, something about their character or about the way they typically behave. That's all I really have in mind by talking about morally. There can be a lot of rational disagreement, and yet the discussion still need not be you know, irrational or unreasonable discussions. Um, what I want from my fellow human beings doesn't have to be just arbitrary. But if I think that it is absolutely as cut and dry, who is a good human being, who is a bad human being, or, or just an act, whether an act is all things considered good or bad, if I think that's as cut and dry, as the judgment about whether the claw hammer is a good tool of its kind. Yeah, I'm deceiving myself. Of course, there's lots of room for people to disagree when you get to something as abstract and wide as what's actually a good or a bad human being. And we, we deal with this from 
die to die. Yeah, that's an ambiguity that we are capable of dealing with. We are quite you know, fluent in, in making those sorts of judgments and hearing those sorts of judgments from others, being able to have rational discussions about it and getting along, even though there may be quite a lot of agreement, I'd say there may be quite a lot of disagreement as well as agreement between us, and there may be no ultimate way of settling it such as by saying, well, God agrees with me or the universe itself somehow agrees with me. So what I want to suggest here is that although the judgment is ultimately subjective and it depends upon the needs, the purposes, the wants of subjects, the things with subjectivity, and it's not somehow built into the structure of the universe itself, although it's not yeah, objective in that strong sense, we can have perfectly rational um, views about what is a good human being or a bad human being. We only become naive if we think that our views are correct in some absolute way and there's no room for rational disagreement. There's plenty of room for rational disagreement on something as wide as that. And there's plenty of room for rational disagreement on something as wide as whether you know, it's what the criteria are for good acts and bad acts. Now again, what I say is, we can live with that kind of ambiguity. We are the sort of creatures that deal with that kind of ambiguity every day. You know, we're quite fluent with negotiating this through as we deal with others. And we don't need to claim that anything like the universe itself is on our side. We just need to appeal to you know, the kinds of wants, needs, purposes, and so on that we have, and which other people are likely to have. There will be a great deal of agreement. Yet you know, very largely, we will agree on values, needs, purposes, and so on. Not totally. Uh, and if I were you know, an intelligent sandworm from Mars, there might not be that much agreement at all between what I value quite rationally and what you value. But as it happens, I'm not an intelligent sandworm from Mars. I'm another member of a subspecies, Homo sapiens sapiens, and it's likely that there will be widespread values that I largely share with you, and we can have these kinds of discussions you know, quite sensibly and reach a great deal of agreement without ever invoking anything like a supernatural agency or some kind of objective moral order or some kind of objective order of values. Now, where does that lead us? Well, I think what would destroy rational discussion would not be realising all this. What destroys rational discussion is when people become dogmatic, inflexible, even fanatical thinking that their values, or the things that they need, or want, or desire, or personal desire to attribute, are the only ones. And that no other person can have different values, needs, purposes, desires, and so on. Effective attitudes, I often talk about, meaning, hopes, fears, desires, and so on. Yeah, if you think that the effective attitudes that you have towards things, the things that you desire, are the only ones that any rational creature could have. And you conduct an argument about what is a good anything on that basis, you are likely to find that you know, you'll be seen as you know, dogmatic and flexible and not a very good, from the other person's point of view, person to have around. You know, we usually think that good people to have around are people who are a bit flexible about these things. People who are not you know, dogmatic and fanatical. So you only go wrong, you, you, well you go wrong, not when you acknowledge that values are not ultimately objective, because they're not ultimately objective. You go wrong if you imagine that the values that you happen to have, or the effective attitudes that you happen to take of things, are the only ones that any you know, rational being in the world can take. Yeah, that is simply not so. And yet, you know, for the reasons I've been giving, <laughs> It's possible and perfectly non-arbitrary, you know, reasonable and rational, you know, value of judgments about all sorts of things, ranging from things where it's going to be clear, there's going to be probably complete agreement like law has, to things where, for reasons that are perfectly understandable, there's always going to be a whole lot of disagreement, such as what's a good human being. Right. So one thing that you can get from all of this is yeah, there will be people there 
in the world that you have to deal with, who you know, value different things from you, perhaps not entirely because human beings have a lot of commonality, but to some extent at least. There will be human beings who take different attitudes to things, you know, they may fear different things from what you fear, they may you know, desire or want different things from what you want, you know, their purposes, aims, goals and so on, might be different from yours. You, know, you, you acknowledge all of that, and yet we are able to live that kind of ambiguity. We are fluent in dealing with our fellow human beings despite all of that. So that's one implication of what I'm saying. So what I'm saying, I, I don't think it leaves everything just as it was. You know, if we take this seriously, it, you know, it does actually have implications for us. You know, one of those implications might be realising that although our value judgments are non-arbitrary and can be perfectly rational and reasonable, you know, they are not the only ones available in the context. That's you know, one implication. Another implication is we might actually find ourselves changing the way we talk, at least to some extent. Contrary to everything I've been saying so far, it does seem to me that most people, when they're at least talking about moral things, such as what's a good human being, or what's a good act, fall into the trap of thinking that the values, desires, etc. that they are using make that judgment, are the only ones. Notoriously, a lot of people think that God is on their side, right? You know, God makes those very same judgments. In fact, they may have got those judgments from a holy book in some cases. Now, a lot of people fall into that fallacy. Even if they don't believe in God, they may think that somehow it's built into the fabric of the universe itself what is a good act or a good human being. Now, these moral values, people often seem to think, are somehow built in the framework of reality itself. You know, they, they did not do what I have done in the past two years, like go back, what does good mean in the first place? In simple cases, like the claw hammer, they go straight to what does good mean in a case like a moral judgment, a judgment about someone's character, or a judgment about acts. And in those sorts of cases, where there can be most disagreement, they tend to get most dogmatic. Most you know, prepared to say, this is the only judgment that anyone can make, and you, know, you are yourself, you're know, perhaps evil, if you make some other kind of judgment. Now, if we think the way I've been explaining this, explaining my life and all this, you know, we, we will avoid that fallacy. And when we do so, we may find ourselves speaking differently.